Welcome to Leaders Upgraded, the place where people who want to upgrade and fast track their career, their life, and their leadership journey tend to gather. I am your host, Tanvi Gautam, and I shall be speaking to the top 10% of the world's leading authors, CEOs, coaches, and thinkers to bring you some of the best and brilliant ideas to fast track your way to success. Would you like an upgrade? Let's do this. Yeah, I'm going to be talking to Herminia Ibarra who is a globally renowned expert. She is the winner of Thinker's 50 Award. She wrote a book on called Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader. And this, this podcast is based on a conversation on her book. But before we get into that, I have three questions for you, which are related to what you're going to be listening to today. So the first question is this. Are you very good at something you do and you think that that is going to be the path to your journey to the top? Question number two, are you in an industry that is in the midst of a lot of change? And I'd be surprised if the answer was no, because almost all industries are on the verge of being disrupted in some shape or form. And the third question is, do you spend a lot of time introspecting on how to be a better leader? If you answered yes to even one of these questions, you are in big trouble. And that's what the podcast would lead you to understand. The reason is because a lot of us, when we start focusing on things that we are good at, end up in what is known as a competency trap to focus on those specific areas. And we very often don't get into experimentation as trying on new skills or taking on projects that would expand our capability set. The question was around rapid change. We are in an industry that has got a lot of rapid change. It requires new ways of acting and thinking. Often there is no blueprint for how do we act in an unknown situation? How do we act when there does not exist a map to the territory? And that is linked to the third idea of introspection because one of the things that Herminia talks about is that we need to replace this idea of introspection as a leader with a slightly different approach becoming a leader. A lot of work that Hermine Ibarra does is related to our identity as a leader. And many of you who are listening to this recognize that becoming a leader is not just about acquisition of certain competencies or skills as much as it is about taking on a new identity of thinking of oneself as a leader as well as behaving in a manner that is consistent with what leading in a new environment requires. So in the podcast that follows, you will hear about what generally happens to people as they start stepping into the unknown where they have to lead. And what are some of the ways in which they can tackle that experience? Some very interesting ideas, uh, some very different ideas as always on uh, the show. And I look forward to listening to what your reflections were as you listen to the podcast. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Leadership Podcast. I am delighted that today we are talking to Herminia Ibarra. She is the Cora Chair Professor of Leadership and Learning at INSEAD. And she is also one of the world's leading thinkers when it comes to leadership and has won the Thinkers 50 Award and is a much celebrated author and thought leader on the topic of leadership. So welcome. Tanvi. It's a pleasure to be here. I have been reading your book, and I have to say that the number of interesting and insightful ideas there will make sure that this conversation is a real treat for anyone who takes leadership and leadership development seriously. And uh, I wanted to start by making a note of the fact that normally when we think about leadership development, we almost always everywhere in MBA schools and in organizations begin by saying, so where are you at? Where do you want to go? And let's chart a path to that. And we're all chugging along just fine till you decide to write a book called Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader, which says, now hold it right there. That's not the way to go about it. So could you share with us what you think is the issue with the current approach to leadership development and what is the way we really should be thinking about it? All right. Well, let me just back up a little bit. I'm 
I'm not saying that it's impossible to step back and think, where do I want to go in the future? Where do I want to be? The thing is, we normally are better able to answer those questions with regard to what industry or what kind of position or entrepreneurial plans, the kind of the big buckets. What's harder to plan out and anticipate and think about is what kind of leader do I want to be, irregardless of what context I'm in. And in particular, what kind of leader do I want to be when we start making that delicate transition that gets you out of a functional role, a functional role, an expertise, leading teams that are doing the same kind of thing that you grew up doing in your career. As we start stepping up to bigger leadership roles that require more organizational leadership in a much more strategic approach, hard to project out what kind of leader do I want to be and that's why what I have seen in my research that it's much more important to start doing on leadership roles experimenting and in the process of getting first-hand experience with yourself in different kinds of capacity then you start to make it concrete in flesh and blood and really figure out the kind of leader that you want to grow into once we start getting into a skill set that is rather intangible. It's about how you do what you do, how you connect to people. There is no substitute for learning by doing. I, I remember there's a line in the book which says, knowing what kind of leader you want to be comes last, not first in the stepping up process. And stepping up is a process and not an event, right? Let me, let's take another example. So people know that the right answer is that they should learn to delegate better, right? Right. That's kind of universal. They also know, sheepishly, that they're probably control freak micro, micromanagers. That <laughs> happens a lot, right? right? Yeah. So you've got this great knowing-doing gap. So mm -hmm. I should be delegating. Don't. How do you bridge that gap? You can reflect on what is it in your childhood that made you yes. less like to delegate, or you could introspect and understand that you're actually worried about your own bottom line, but that doesn't actually get you doing what you think the right answer is. Mm. Another approach is to say, okay, what's the context in which I could figure it out in which I could do it in a smaller scale way or who's a person who does that well and still manages to perform and what can I learn from that person mm. and in the process of starting to do it of realizing that you gave your team a bigger chunk of it they ran with it and not only did they do a good job but you freed up your time to do something else that you had to do you start integrating the value of delegating and the value of empowering people as part of who you are as a leader and it's no longer this abstract theory about what you think you should be doing something that is informed by your practice and starts becoming part of your identity as a leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, okay. So what, what I'm hearing you say is that even if you sent me to the world-famous school of delegation, I would probably come back with nothing till I have invited the act of learning how to delegate for myself. Here to be part of how you define yourself as a leader. Mm -hmm until you have actually done enough of it right. to see value, become better at it, mm. and come to see yourself as that kind of person, and that's a behavioral process. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's this, this concept that you, you talk about, which is called outside, which I had never heard of before. I'm assuming that's a term that you, you coined as part of your research. Could you talk a little bit about what do you mean when you talk about outside and why is it important in the scheme of things? So it is indeed a term that I coined. And what I want to do is to create a contrast to insight which is something that you get from reflection and to, and, and to make a contrast with the kinds of knowledge that you only get with external perspective mm. and with an external perspective that obviously then allows you to connect the dots and have what we normally call the flash of insight mm. but a lot of the times what we need people to learn more about is not in their past experience transitions i studied it's a new and unfamiliar situation you haven't done it before so there's nothing much you can introspect about what you need to do is get external perspective mm. on 
what your job is all about, what other people expect, how other people do it, what's happening with other peers in your organization, how competitors are doing things. That is with yourself. You can you can have insight into how you have behaved in the past. Mm -hmm. But it's in order to figure out how to get better or do things differently in the present, you need to experiment with unfamiliar behaviors and then see what happens. How did it work? How did you feel? How did other people react? Mm -hmm. So outside mm -hmm. is just the, the external perspective you get mm -hmm. from engaging in new behaviors, new activities, from connecting with different kinds of people that start populating a new experience set from which then you can interest. So, so it sounds like, you know, when we are dealing with the level of uncertainty and complexity that we are dealing with in the business environment, that very often, either given our, our experiences or our stage, perhaps just the environment, that there may not be a pre-existing experience set or a mental model or a sort of, you know, go-to space, even if we decided to introspect in which case the outside is what is enable us to deal with the situation that we are in. Am I right? Exactly. Exactly. That's it. All right. Great. Another thing that you have been writing about, and I've seen some of the articles that you wrote about, is this idea of the authenticity paradox, right? And there's a there's a point in the book where you say authenticity is overrated and can actually come in the way of transitioning into new roles and can be an excuse to perhaps stay in your comfort zone. And I can hear a thousand people turning in their grave and otherwise who have been onto this authenticity bandwagon talking about where well, you have to be authentic. It's about creating authentic workplaces and, you know, authenticity is where the future is at. But, but you're yeah. saying we need to take a step back and look at how this may actually be coming in the way of what we are trying to achieve. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. And let me start by being clear. Authenticity is a great value. So I'm not arguing for inauthenticity. Right. I think to the extent that we can be authentic in our leadership at work, we will be happier, more effective, and more empowering of people. So, so that's, that is correct. What I take quarrel with is naive definition of authenticity to mean I have to be as I have always been, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's lots of different ways you can define authenticity, being true to yourself. Mm -hmm. but, but what self are you being true to? Your historical self, yourself as it is today, yourself as you would like to be in the future. Mm -hmm yourself at home, yourself at work, yourself in a situation in which you're confident, yourself in a situation in which you're out of your depth and not feeling very confident. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's lots of different facets to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what happens is what we actually want is people to be authentic to their core values and their, and their aspirations. Mm -hmm. And very, very naively, people use authenticity to mean I have to be fully transparent. I have to say everything that grows through my mind. Mm. I can't get out of my comfort zone because it doesn't feel like the real me. Mm. I've heard people, when you push them a bit on why, if they value, if they think listening is such a critical part of their leadership, why aren't they better at it? Why don't they do more of it? And ultimately, they will say, well, the kind of person I am is somebody who kind of jumps in with a lot of energy and my ideas, and I value my expertise more, and that's who I am. Well, that's authentic, but that's not very effective, and that's not very productive in terms of developing your leadership. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of what I'm arguing is, is naive definitions of authenticity. Other thing that I'm arguing against is there are times in your life in which the two dictates that everybody agrees with, be authentic and get out of your comfort zone, are going to clash. Mm -hmm. One step up to a transition, asking you to play a role that you've never played with, be played before. You don't know how to do that job. It's unfamiliar. It's a stretch. Anything that you do that has the vaguest chance of being effective is going to feel contrived, fake, inauthentic because you haven't developed it. It's not in your skill set. It's not what you prefer to do. It takes you out of your depth. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you do when you're faced with that situation? You can be what I called some people in one of my studies, a true to selfer. And a true to selfer says, that's not me. So I'm just going to stick with what I know and feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes that just slows your learning curve because that's not what that role demands. Mm -hmm. Or you can say, okay, I don't know how to do this. Where do I start? 
well, let me look at some people who do this well. Let me ideally try to pick some that I admire and respect. Mm -hmm. But you know, in some cases, let me just take whatever I can. Mm -hmm. What are they doing? What are some of the things that I can try out? What are some of the things I might be able to adapt to myself? <laughs> What's behind what they're doing? When you take that approach, say you're not a good communicator, all of a sudden you're in a role where you really have to rally the troops. And you've seen that the people who are really great at that, they tell a personal story, kind of touch people a bit in the gut. They're not just about the statistics and the numbers. That's totally not you. You're really rational mm. and don't like to mix the business case with the personal. Mm. But you're seeing that you're not achieving the results. So you try what you see other people doing. You try to make it a bit more personal. You try to make it a bit emotional. I can guarantee you, because I've seen people going through this, they're going to feel like fakes and imposters because it's not them. But guess what? If you stick with it for a while, eventually you come to a way of doing that different from what you used to do before, which was just present your spreadsheet. Maybe it's not as personal as some of the role models you had, but you grow, you learn, you start to see how you can infuse it with something that is more of a personal touch. And over time, if you're successful, you start to to integrate that into your skill set and your identity as a leader. That's becoming authentic. That's not being inauthentic, but sometimes the path to it is going to pull you out of anything feels like the real you today in the here and now. What is like uh, say that's not me that doesn't feel authentic is being used as an excuse to not be who you could possibly be right exactly exactly now who you could possibly be is also an abstract thing until you've actually played around with it I picked up on that theme as as, as I was reading um, and I, I don't know if this is this is the place where you know I it connects with another th thing that you mentioned in your book which was which which I want to dwell on a little bit because I find that um, a lot of executives struggle with this idea a little bit, which was to that when you're managing a transition process from, you know, what you're comfortable with and then adopting a new skill set or behavior that, you know, may not feel authentic right now, but ultimately is something you need to step into. And you talk about this idea of free from your obby self or important people in your life think you ought to be is at the heart of the transition process. And I somehow, some, some way get the sense that there could be an entire podcast just around that idea itself. Because I have seen a lot of people struggle with this. I ought to be doing this and I ought to be doing that. And, and, and there doesn't seem to be enough of a opportunity to think about how or why we need to step away from that. So could you, could you dwell a little bit more on what you were trying to say when you made that statement? Sure. We're trying to imagine ourselves different role in a different capacity as a more impactful leader. We have all kinds of images that come to our head about what that would be like. And some of them are our own ideals, maybe based on some great role models we've had in the past. Some of them are you know, the more playful, unique uh, ways of imagining ourselves in the future. And some of them are normative prescriptions that we've gotten from other people. Mm -hmm. I'll, you know, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you an example that comes up a lot. This uh, a very common thing is as women start stepping up to more senior leadership roles, they're faced with an ought, what it looks like to be an impactful, effective leader mm. that comes from mostly male role models. Yeah. And those oughts that are there are somehow not fitting with her conception of which way she wants to go or what would necessarily work, but they exist because they're based on how other people have been successful. This is very common, too, as well, for people who are in a business context in which they're a bit of a cultural minority yeah. in terms of their national background. The odds, the way it looks like to lead impactfully at a higher level, don't quite fit the behavioral norms that they learned growing up and being socialized in their culture. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, part of what you have to do is figure out What's behind it? Is that odd something that um, you should be paying attention to or not? Is there a kind of um, 
a more abstract headline for you to integrate. So maybe the specifics of how you do it can be more your own, but what's not negotiable is say having a clear view strategically or what's not negotiable getting people to buy into the things you're proposing and then the how you do it maybe has thoughts to it associated with how other people have done it but you can make them your own let's dwell for a minute with that example of of women rising to senior leadership positions right right so we have these women who are used to being more collaborative and consultative in the way they have been socialized and the way that feels authentic to them and when they kind of look up they notice that a lot of women who are you know in the board level roles or in senior leadership positions have adopted this this rather masculine type of leadership so if i'm standing at that crossroad and i have read your book which is that i need to act like a leader first before i can start thinking like the leader that that i can be what would be a starting point what would be your suggestion what would be the concrete steps so there's a lot to be said on that topic because yeah. i you know women have more ops put on to them there's some arts that have to do with how to be a leader and there's some arts that have to do with how you should behave as a woman right. and what we know from research is that when these two things clash you end up in a bit of a catch 22 mm. collaborative and consultative you don't look like you're quote unquote acting like a man but then people say well you know what's her value added and yeah. <laughs> is she visionary and does she have potential whereas if you act in a way that seems to look more like the male prototype then people will say oh she's trying too hard she's trying to act like a man yeah. and so and and we can drive ourselves crazy trying to figure out how to tow a middle line between both of these which of course doesn't really exist mm. <laughs> um, so i would back up to that because there you know there are women who maybe are quite collaborative and don't get credit but there are women who are not collaborative and then get criticized for not being enough of a team player it goes it, go, it goes both ways mm. and i think the place to start is really to step back and say what's the juncture at which i find myself what are the expectations for a more senior role and do I, do i understand them and who can help me with that what kind of assignments do i need in order to hone those skills what kind of mentors and sponsors how can i broaden up my network so that i can learn those things better or at least figure out if i want to try but it's not just about the style it's about a whole context in which some people have an easier time getting access to the assignments that develop those skills and develop the networks some people get more coaching and more feedback than others mm-hmm. and so i wouldn't pin it all on a question of styles that either fit or don't fit masculine or feminine prototypes mm-hmm. and i like i like the fact that you raised the issue of access to opportunity and networks and i'll i'll come to that you know in just a minute my observation on on the issue has been that there is a lot to be said for the g or austerity that women need to end up displaying in terms of you know when you need to push and when you need to hold back and 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 some somewhere that 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 dexterity is required more for women than it is for men i don't even think whether men even think about about some of these things the way we end up thinking about them and and, and so much of that yeah. right but i want to talk about networks because you know i i have been reading your work on networks and you know you've talked about the operational networks which we all seem to be very good at and then the personal networks which feed often into our leadership roles and then the strategic networks which you say tend to be a major gap area for a lot of people um and i noticed no new acronym in the book which was about the d right the the breadth the connectivity and the dynamism of your network enabling your transition into the roles and i think that's a really really interesting idea if you could talk about that that bcd concept that you have highlighted okay a, a step back there 
in terms of for those who are not familiar with the distinction between operational and strategic networks, operational networks are the networks that most of us have pretty well developed that allow us to get our work done today as it's defined and have helped us be successful in the past. Mm. Strategic networks are the networks that help you get into a next role and help you add value at a higher level beyond the kind of the day-to-day -day grind and routine of your job. Okay, mm. that's the distinction that I made. And they're really critical as you're stepping up to leadership because part of that transition is moving away from an exclusive functional or operational focus in your job to thinking about what are the right questions we should be asking, what's the right positioning strategically, what are we trying to do? And it is your network that helps you get that mm. perspective. Mm. So, so that's just a, a bit of background. Mm. So what makes for a good strategic network? And that's where the BCDs come in. They need to be broad. They need to have cognitivity and they need to evolve with you. Mm. In terms of being broad, they just there needs to be diverse. Mm. I, I about in my book, in my classes, I always have people map out their networks. Mm. And inevitably they find out that their networks are too much focused on their function, on their team, on their business unit, they're too internal. And so they don't really have a breadth that maps out to the complexity of the ecosystem in which their company or their business finds itself. And that's going to limit their strategic mm. perspective because it's going to be geared towards their area of expertise. Yeah. And so yeah. the B is the starting point, is it broad and diverse enough? Mm -hmm. And the, the connectivity really connects to this idea of six degrees of separation or, you know, how, how far out can you reach mm. on the basis of your contacts? Do your contacts basically lead you to the same circles and the same areas of expertise and bodies of knowledge? Or are they really doorways for you to reach different social worlds so you can get different perspectives and connect to different stakeholders that you didn't know directly? Mm. You know, what, what can you access to the people you know already? Is it broad? Is it limited? And the idea there is that now do you need to reach out beyond to get new perspective and information, but also your own capacity to add value depends on your ability to be a connector, a matchmaker, mm -hmm. a referral maker, to see that there is a good idea here and a need for something like that there, or some really great talent here and a team that's forming over there. And you can make introductions. You can connect people so that you're making full use of that diversity for things that are really strategic for the organization. Mm -hmm. So that's the C. And then the dynamism is we often observe, and, and by the way, with regard to the connectivity, what happens is when I ask people about the, their contacts, often they all know each other, in fact, or a lot of them do know each other, and that limits your capacity to branch out. Mm -hmm. On the dynamism, we see a lot that we kind of keep going back to the same usual suspects for advice and for information. Effective. But one of the observations that people make all the time is that their networks are kind of anchored on the past as opposed to helping them build out towards the future. Mm -hmm. And so part of what you want to see in your network is that it's refreshing, that it's renewing, that you're adding new contacts, you know, as you would in LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. But you're actually getting to know and deepen relationships with new people that correspond to your new goals and your new aspirations and your new roles. Mm -hmm. Right. And actually, we just last week, I was doing a session on, you know, the role of social media for that matter in contributing to all the things that you mentioned about. And in some senses, uh, people, are, people are not really tapping into the potential of social well, media to be able to leverage the networks that are now being created online rather than, than just the offline yeah. networks. We just had a big conversation about that in class yesterday with mm. most people feeling that they, not only were they not tapping in, they didn't even know how. Mm. And you know, of course the barrier is that you need to make a significant time investment before you start to see how it pays off. And mm. it does take maintenance and being on it on a regular basis before you get the payoff that you want. Mm. Everything in life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. 
before we kind of wrap up, I I wanted to touch upon a question I had that has been a rather favorite article of mine, and you are likely familiar with it, which was written by Deb Ancona and team a few years ago in the Harvard Business Review, which is called In Praise of the Incomplete Leader. Right. Where the hypothesis is that, you know, you're, you're good at some things and it's great to focus on that. And then you find other people who can make up for things that you are not so good at how where do you think lies the overlap or link between what you are asking future leaders to do and what that article was recommending because what i liked about that article at the end of the day was that it it was in a world where we tend to think of leaders as these you know knights in shining armor and coming and rescuing the world and sort of a heroic model of leadership it kind of opened the door to talk about you know vulnerability and acceptance that you know some some things we are not good at and we're likely never going to be good at it yeah and and then well it's a favorite of mine as mm, well mm. Look, I certainly isn't saying that you have to do it all to be the visionary leader and be highly networked and very inspirational and and everything else but what what mine is saying is that you have to understand how what you do and contribute connects to things that are far beyond what you do and contribute to and to the extent that you get the big picture and how the dots connect, then you're better able to place yourself. Mm-hmm. What are the areas in which I need to grow personally myself? And what are the areas that I can offset with colleagues? Because the sad fact of the matter is that most incomplete leaders, it's fine to be incomplete, but they do not value the people who will most compliment them. Mm-hmm. Where you see the conflicts are precisely because we don't get along or see the value of what people are bringing who are complementary to us. Mm-hmm. And so if you're going to play a bit more of the specialist card, which most of us do, mm-hmm. it really does behoove you to understand and, and, and not just in a superficial, yeah, I need a complementary view, but really get the value of what these other people are bringing and be able to collaborate with them in a serious way as a result of that. Mm, mm, I see what you're saying. Uh, It's been well catching up with you. There is so much food for thought and that book is a, is a treatise and a, a bedside mandatory reading for everyone who's planning on stepping into their uh, future leadership self. Thank you for writing the book and thank you for finding the time to be on this podcast. Thank you, Tammy. It was a pleasure talking with you. So I hope you enjoyed this podcast as much as I did. Um, one of my big takeaways, of course, was that when we think of stepping into a bigger leadership role, it's not an event. It's not. It's not a. It's not a class. It's not a workshop. It's. It's a process, and the process takes some time and requires a particular attitude and mindset. As Herminia was talking about, it requires you to relook at the way you relate to your job. It requires you to relook at the network that you have, and it requires you to do a lot of outs to get to learning the kind of leader you actually want to be. I also think that a very important element of all of this is courage, because in the absence of courage, we will never really step into our leadership potential or be able to do justice to the leadership role. So if you haven't heard the the podcast I did with Seth Gordon on courage as a leader, I would highly recommend that you take a look at that as well. That concludes this episode of Leaders Upgraded. But wait, your journey is just getting started. Go to www.leadersupgraded.com for more insights, more inspiration, and more tools to continue the journey. And if you have someone who you would like to nominate for the podcast or a particular topic you'd like us to cover, then also visit www.leadersupgraded.com and let us know. If you like this episode, please do share it. Please do subscribe to the podcast. And I look forward to continued upgrades with you. Take care.